In this video, I'm going to break down how I would get an internship in 2024. The market is more competitive than ever, but if you follow these principles, you'll drastically improve your chances of landing a software engineering internship this year. If you're new here, my name is Amon. I'm currently a software engineer, and over the past five years, I did five internships at companies like Amazon, Shopify, and landed an internship at HP. And at this point, I've almost mastered the art of securing an internship. Let's get started. Now, a lot of these principles you may have heard before, but letting an internship at this market is more about doing all the correct things right. Principle number one is write an amazing resume. Now this might seem obvious. I mean, every single person who's applying to internships has a put together resume, but you'd be surprised at how many people just don't have it completely optimized. I do already have a completely dedicated video on this topic, but from a high level, here are four principles you need to make your resume amazing. If you haven't already spent hours on your resume, you need to drop everything and do this right now. Number one, use a professional clean template. So you can download my resume template if you click the link in the description, but if you don't want to use that, you can also go into LaTeX and make a great looking resume. From time to time, I'll see people who have colors, drawing symbols in the resume, and for the most part, most of those are unnecessary and actually take away from your resume. So stick to the basics, have a clean professional resume. Second of all, you want to lead with experience. Now you're a student, so you probably don't have that much experience right now, but whatever meager experience you have, you want to pump it up and make it as good as possible. Yes, companies care about your GPA, classes at this point, some projects, but above all of that is your tangible work experience. Now, the most important kind of experience is technical work experience. I see a lot of people who have clubs, they have tutoring on their resume, they have volunteering, and all of that is great, but the most important is some kind of like software or technical experience. This could include research, working as a software dev at a technical club, and obviously prior software or data science or machine learning internships. Now, even if you don't have a lot of technical experience, you need to make your experiences sound as technical as possible. So currently in my coaching program, I'm working with a student named Alion, and he really didn't have a lot of technical experience when we first met. So I had him join the Washington Hyperloop Club, so also he could write down software developer on his resume, because that immediately moves his resume to the next level. So even if you don't have any kind of experience, you need to go out there, think about what kind of technical skills you can acquire in some sort of technical position, and then write it down in your resume. Now, when you're actually filling out these fields, you need to make sure you have action verbs. Action verbs include executed this project, led the development of, spearheaded the development of, stuff like that. And you also want to make sure you have tangible numbers. So created this attribute, which led to 50,000 minutes of improvement, just like have numbers, have big numbers at the end. You also want metrics and finally don't put anything in your resume. That's not technical. I talked to another student who had at the bottom of her resume, other interests. And on that list was tennis, super smash bros brawl. And while it's cute that you like to play tennis on the weekends, it doesn't really add to your technical resume and takes the recruiter's mind off of focusing on software. Like I said before, you can go to a mom and slash resume to get my resume template. Principle number two is to get good at lead code. Again, this might seem obvious, but you're probably going to be surprised by what you hear. Most people think getting good at lead code is spamming hundreds of problems until you eyes bleed and you want to kill yourself. Almost every student I talk to looks me in the eye and says, do I actually need to do lead code? Like I've heard that it's so draining. It's so tough. It's so irritating. It's not fun at all. And I hate doing it. There are a few key aspects to my lead code strategy that differs from most people. And the first one is that you need to start immediately. There is no sense in waiting whatsoever. Even if you're not actively applying to internships, lead code takes months to get good at. So you might as well just start that now and actually be ready when the interview comes. Back in the day, before I did Amazon, I actually got a meta software engineering internship interview. And this was three, four years ago before I had even touched a lot of lead code. So I prepared for a few weeks, but then when I showed up at the interview, I was hit with the lead code hard. I was just completely clueless. I had no idea what to do. I completely failed the interview. That was because I hadn't been preparing lead code for months and months and months beforehand. I've said it before, but lead code is like going to the gym for computer science majors. You just need to keep grinding through lead code problems. Like just a few a week is enough to maintain and probably five to six a week is your sweet spot if you're actually trying to improve. Now, another mistake people make with lead code is that they don't know which problems to focus on. You need to focus on the problems that actually matter, the ones that actually show up. There's this principle called the 80-20 principle or Pareto's principle. And the idea is that 20% of the inputs create 80% of the outputs. 20% of the people contain 80% of the wealth. So the top 20% of the engineers create 80% of the results for the company. Now, it's not about the actual numbers of 20 and 80. What it's more about is the idea that a small number of inputs create the vast majority of the outputs and lead code is no different. If you apply the 80-20 principle to lead code, you realize that there's just a few principles or a few topics that if you study will apply to the majority of coding interviews. There's this website called Algo Monster, which did this 
massive analysis of hundreds and hundreds of coding interviews. And they found that the highest ROI topics were two pointers, arrays, strings, hash tables, binary search, and DFS. That's pretty much it. Think about that. These are just four or five topics out of dozens that you could study. And in fact, I bet you these are the topics that you've actually seen if you've done some coding interviews or OAs. You probably haven't really seen that much dynamic programming out there in the wild. Trust me, I've done dozens of coding interviews. I've not seen more than a few dynamic programming problems ever. I haven't seen any kind of math or geometry stuff, maybe like a handful of times. And if you're trying to land your first internship, why would you worry about all these high level topics that are just never going to show up? You must master the basics, and those include those like array, hash tables, graphs, strings, and trees. Basic, basic stuff. Now what I would recommend doing is locking that principle in your mind, that you only need to focus on a few topics, but you need to get really good at those topics very fast. In fact, right now the hiring season is a little bit slower than the fall, so you have yourself maybe four or five months where you can grind, get really good at these basic topics, and then when you get interviewed in the fall, you'll land your internship then, because you'll be ready. What I would do is I would work my way through the need code 150. The Neatcode 150 is this ultimate list of high impact programming problems curated by Neatcode. Neatcode is a YouTuber. I'm sure you guys have heard of him before. He's like a god in the coding space. His solutions are far better than any other YouTuber or solution guide I've ever seen. I would go to Neatcode.io, make an account there, and then slowly work my way through all the topics on that list. Specifically, I would work through arrays and hashing, two pointers, sliding window, binary search, linked list, trees, heap slash priority queue and graphs. Those are eight subsections of the Neat Code 150. And I would do it in that order. So I wouldn't jump all the way to graphs if you haven't worked through arrays and trees and linked lists. Now within these sections, I would first start by doing the easies. The benefit of these easies is that they actually introduce you to the data structures and algorithms needed to solve these problems. I remember a few years back when I was first doing tree problems, I had no idea how to do any of them. So I worked through like five or six of these easies, actually understood the basis behind solving tree lead code problems before I could apply it to a difficult medium. So that's what I would recommend doing. Start by going through the easies, use the easies to actually learn the algorithms and then tackle the medium. And finally, you don't actually have to do all of the mediums. I only ever ended up doing three to four mediums from each section, but even that was enough to really grasp the principles behind these topics. Lead code easies are there so you can grasp the very fundamentals of the algorithm. The mediums are there to challenge and actually stretch yourself and you should never do hearts. I'm a firm believer in this. You should never ever touch lead code hards, especially if you're only going for internships. Hards are a waste of time and end up causing serious depression. I'm at the point where, yeah, I can solve a few lead code hards, but it's almost never a good use of time to focus on hards when instead you can focus on mediums. Because at the end of the day, 95% of coding interviews are going to be easies and mediums. Unless you're going for TikTok or Snowflake or Quant, mediums are going to be your best bet. Now, when you actually pick a problem to solve, open the lead code problem, have a pen and paper with you, and set like a 45 minute timer. You should spend about five minutes reading and understanding the problem, then about five to 10 minutes just like brainstorming or writing on your notebook, trying to actually find what the algorithm is to solve this problem. Always start with brute force. I find that brute force helps me focus my mind and actually come up with a better solution. After you've done that, after you've come up with a really good solution on paper, then you can spend about 15 to 20 minutes coding it up and debugging. The key here is that if you can't figure out what the solution is in about 10 to 20 minutes of brainstorming, of thinking on pen and paper, of putting your mind to it, you might want to just actually look at what the solution is. And this is kind of unpopular. A lot of people think that, oh, it's cheating to look at the solution. It's, I shouldn't be doing that. I was taught not to do that. But when it comes to lead code, if you're sitting there for 30, 40, 50 minutes, just staring at a problem trying to solve it, you're not going to get anywhere. And you might be better served just actually looking at the solution, understanding it, and then coding it up. Now, I don't think you should look at the code. Just look at the solution, take your pen and paper, actually understand what they're saying, and then code it up yourself. If you code it, it means you actually understand it. But you don't want to look at the actual code because that will shortcut that process. Now, if you find yourself having to look at the solution for almost every problem you do, it means that the problems you're solving are too hard. You need to drop it down by one level. So if you're doing mediums, then go down to easies. If you can't solve easies, then I would recommend watching some more videos on coding. Maybe try to find like easier easies, ones that have like a really high solve rate and focusing on those. Now, this is a little bit of a side tip when it comes to lead code, but you're going to want to use Python. Most schools actually teach Java or C++ as their first language. So a lot of students have in their mind that they already know Java, they already know C++, so they'll just use that instead. But that's a terrible idea because Java, C++, I learned Java and C in school, and they're unnecessarily complicated. You have a lot of syntax errors. It's hard to write Java really quickly. When instead you can use Python, you'll be about 30 to 40% faster, and it's actually easier 
to explain your solution. Python is way more simple than these other unnecessarily complex languages for coding interviews. Now, if you don't know Python, it's not a big deal. You're gonna have to force yourself to learn it over the next few weeks. I was like this. I didn't know any Python. I started in Java and soon I realized that Python was a way better option. What I would recommend doing is watching tutorials on how to go from your favorite language to Python. So what I did was I searched Java to Python YouTube. There was like a 10 minute tutorial which explained the different syntaxes between Java and Python. You want to get the basic structures like loops, conditionals, arrays, reverse for loops, dictionaries, hash tables, stuff like that. And then just start using Python. Once you've made your basic notes on what the syntax is, just solve all your lead code in Python. And when you start off with, it's going to be difficult. You're going to have to look at what the syntax is online. You're going to have to look stuff up, but it's fine. That's where the massive growing happens. And looking back six months from now, you'll be so happy that you switched to Python for your coding interviews. I'll link one of Neat Code's videos in the description where he talks about Python for coding interviews and he breaks down what you actually need to know in Python for these coding interviews because it's really not that much. Finally, it will take months, but it is necessary to become good at lead code. You will be pretty ass at first. I mean, I remember I wrote this linked list solution a couple years back and it was ungodly complicated. It was horrible. It was a terrible, terrible solution. It'll be weirdly long and messy. It will take you hours to solve a medium, but through months and years of effort, you will become much, much better. Trust me. That's what happened for me. My next principle is about timing. When is the best time to land an internship? And unfortunately, the best time is fall. The best time to get a software engineering internship is usually around the October, November period. That's when the peak of hiring happens. That's when everybody's getting their OAs, interviews, offers. The best time to apply is around that like July, August period. And the best time to get interviewed is around October, November. But even though it's late in the cycle right now, you still have time. I know people out there who just had their Amazon final rounds. I know people out there who are getting Netflix interviews, meta interviews. My Shopify full-time offer was actually rescinded last year in March when I was a senior in college. And around that time, it was really, really late in the recruiting cycle. I didn't see a lot of companies open up, not many positions were open. So I decided to look at internships and full-time and decide to just maybe do one more semester of school if I got an internship. And in April of 2023, extremely late in the cycle, I landed an HP software engineering internship. This was like one or two months before the position actually started. So trust me, yes, during February and March, if you're at a bad time in the market, most of the good roles will be taken, but you still have a chance and it is still worth looking. Now in this market, the only way you will have success is through referrals and word of mouth, especially if you're going for your first internship. This is an unpopular topic. People don't like to talk about how the only way they'll get interviewed is if they have a referral or a hiring manager's email, or they know someone who works at the company. First of all, my first two internships were gotten through word of mouth. So my first one was at a local insurance company. I knew someone who worked there. My parents had friends who worked there. So we were able to talk to the hiring manager and I was able to get their email and email them my resume. And my second internship at John Deere, I applied with a referral, but nobody interviewed me until we reached out to one of our family friends who was a high up at John Deere. He emailed the hiring manager saying that they should interview me. And voila, within that day, I got the interview. It's unpopular, but you're going to have to use connections, referrals, word of mouth. Now, if you already have three, four, five software engineering internships, sure, maybe then you can have luck with a company like Palantir or Amazon or Meta. But if you're going for your first one, you are going to need to use connections. Now, my coaching client, Alion, he applied to 200 roles and he got one OA one OA out of 200 applications, and he wasn't able to pass it. Then we started working together, and the first assignment I had him do is write down every single family friend he knows and what company they work at. And his assignment was to reach out to these people, ask them if their company has any kind of internships, any kind of open roles, anything at all. Because you'd be surprised, many of these companies have kind of like hidden internships that they're not putting tons of ad spend for the roles to show up on LinkedIn so you might not know about. And if any one of these companies has an open role, you can simply ask your family, friend, or relative to get the hiring manager's email so you can send your resume to them. I'm even helping him use my network to get referrals, which is something I will help you do if you join my coaching program. I recently launched the first cohort of the Software Engineering Accelerator. This program is all set on me helping you land an internship or job in tech. If you want to join the Accelerator and work directly with me on achieving your goals, click the link in the description and we can see if the program is a good fit for you. If you do everything in this video, you'll have a solid shot of landing an internship, but if you want to almost guarantee your first internship, work directly with me, we'll make it happen. Now back to the referral talk. So that HP internship I mentioned earlier that I got late in the cycle, that only happened because I knew someone who worked at HP. HP. Right after my Shopify offer got rescinded, I immediately messaged five to 10 of my friends saying that, hey, my offer got rescinded. I need help. Do your companies have any open roles or do you know anyone who's hiring right now? And luckily one of my friends, her name is Amy, shout out to her. She was at HP. She mentioned that 
she was talking to her manager and her manager just let it slip that one of their interns had decided to quit. As soon as she heard her manager say that, she immediately sent my resume to her manager. Her manager got my resume, saw all the internships I had, and then immediately decided to interview me. I got through the interview within like a few days. All the questions were super easy because I'd been lead coding. The lead code was not bad and finally got an offer to join HP. Now that only happened because I told everybody in my network I was applying, I was looking for roles, and I just got lucky and a role opened up and I was at the ready. In this market, you need referrals. You cannot just blindly apply to position. Next, I'm gonna talk about which roles did you actually apply to. Depending on how experienced you are, the roles I would apply to are different. And most people are not doing this. I see a lot of people out there who have no internships and they're applying to work at Uber, TikTok, Meta, and they're surprised when they're not getting a response back. If I was a freshman or sophomore and I had no software engineering experience, I would not even look at those companies. Unless you're a competitive programmer or a lead code god, I would recommend focusing primarily on companies in your local area, or especially companies within the surrounding cities. So in the coaching program, I recently did this exercise where I went on Google Maps, I scrolled around, I found a random city. This particular example was Reno, Nevada. And then I immediately searched software engineering internship Reno, Nevada, scrolled down, clicked on a few positions, and then found an internship at this company that was offering a role for $26 an hour. Now you can use the salary range to understand how prestigious this internship is. So if the internship is offering between 15 and $25 an hour, that's a great, great first internship. The fact that they're paying you means that they take your time seriously. And more importantly, those roles are not going to be hounded after like the Ubers or the Lyfts or the Googles who are offering 50, 60, $70 an hour to interns. You will not get an interview if you go for a big name company. Your only luck is to find a smaller company like that and then ideally find the LinkedIn for the hiring manager and then reach out to them after you apply. If you do this for 10 to 20 roles, you will drastically improve your chances of getting interviewed. Now, if I had one to two internships on my resume, my strategy would be slightly different. Then I would go to this GitHub page. So this list is from Simplified Jobs. They compile all the updated internships and open positions that are on the market. And crucially, I wouldn't just go down the list and apply to every single position. Instead, I would think to myself, okay, who in my network works at these companies? Then you can make a short list of about three to five companies that you know people who work there. And then finally, you can take that list and then you can actually message your friends and get referrals for those companies. Finally, if you have two to three internships in your resume, now you're at the point where you can actually cold apply to these roles. You'll cold apply and you actually might have a shot of getting heard back from, but at this point in this market, I would recommend always, always have a hiring manager email, always get a referral. Let's talk about how the strategy changes for each level. What's the same and what's different? Now, the resume strategy is the same. You want your resume to be as good as possible, whether you have no internships or you have 10 internships. The referral strategy is the same. For every position you apply to, you want to either get a referral or a hiring manager email. Those are the golden two things. You get an official referral submitted, and then if you find a hiring manager email, you can email them and forward them your resume. What differs is the positions that you should actually focus your time and effort on. So like I said earlier, if you have no internships, you should just turn your eyes away from any kind of fang company or unicorn. You're not gonna get interviewed by them. But once you have two, three internships, then you can actually set salary and pay goals for these roles. If you want my ultimate internship checklist, where I actually go through all of these principles and even more detail with more information, you can go to amanmanazar.com slash internship checklist or hit the link in the description. You can download it right there completely for free. That document will take every one of these principles even further. Thank you guys for watching. Like will be incredible and I will see you in the next video.